Guys, we're going to start up. I think, I think we're good. So welcome. I'm, I'm Brian Mattimore. I'm chief idea guy at a company called Growth Engine. We're a 19-year-old innovation agency based in Norwalk, Connecticut. And we help companies come up with new stuff, essentially. Um, the, uh, I, I, the Kintone mission statement here, uh, making teamwork better global, globally, I love that. I mean, I've spent my entire now very long career um, helping teams generate more and better ideas. And the uh, second book I've written, Idea Stormers, this is it here, this is really about team processes to create new and better ideas. The contribution to the field that this has made is that there was never a book that talked about it's a bit of an overstatement. For the, for the most part, there was never a book that talked about which techniques to use when in order to generate different kinds of ideas. And so that's been the contribution of the field that that book has made. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you a bunch of, we'll call them empirically validated approaches. Um, I, I can be confident making that statement because I personally have facilitated over 1,000 ideation sessions. Uh, 500 focus groups, and we kind of know, kind of, sort of, maybe, know which techniques work best against different kinds of creative challenges. So if it's a new product development challenge, we do something different than it's, if it's a positioning challenge, or if it's a cost-cutting challenge, or a strategy challenge. And so I'm going to share with you some of the techniques that tend to be a little more all-purpose, so you can use them for whatever you have to do. Um, I'll have real-world examples. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be fun for you. We'll do a mini uh, creative exercise together just to have you experience what I'm talking about. So that's what we're up to, and hopefully that's why you came. Yes? Maybe kind of, sort of, hopefully. Um, I want to just very briefly talk about the different difference between brainstorming and ideation. Uh, do you, how many of you guys do, quote, brainstorming? Uh, and, and brainstorming typically would be something like somebody comes in and says, OK, let's get some ideas together, right? Who's got some ideas? And, and who's got some more ideas? And oh yeah, and, and what are the two roles of brainstorming, guys? What are those two roles? Yes. No yeah, no negative comments, withhold judgment. Some people say there are no bad ideas, which is what? Not true. <laughs> it is not true. Most of the ideas are bad. 90 per, what, what percentage are bad, do you think? A, 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 man, you're there. It's, it's about 90% bad is overstating it. But when we do an ideation session, we'll typically generate 150, 200 ideas in a day, right? Of those, 15 to 20 will be really quite good. OK, so you're looking at a 90% quote failure rate. So that's the first kind of, uh, quote, rule of brainstorming, withhold judgment, yes? Or, quote, no bad ideas. What's the second rule? It was sort of implicit in what, what I just said. Anybody know what the, quote, second rule of brainstorming is? It's that quantity will equal quality, OK? So generate a lot of stuff, and you'll get some ideas. How is the brain, by the way, brainstorming is a misused term in the world, just so you know. It's, it's used as a generic for let's get together and come up with ideas. It was actually a specific technique invented in the late 1930s by Alex Osborne, the O of BBDO ad, ad agency. Um, and it was w against those two rules. In the 80 years since it was invented, uh, there's been quite a bit of research that said brainstorming really doesn't work great. I mean, it's OK. But you know, one of our clients, uh, Chips Ahoy Cookies, right? So, or, or Oreo Cookies, another client. We go into Oreo Cookie. How long has the Oreo Cookie brand been around? Anybody know? Yeah, it's a little over 100 years. They celebrated their 100th anniversary. So if I went in there and said, hey, let's come up with some new Oreo ideas. Who's got an idea? Anybody? Who's got an idea? Should they throw me out of the room? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because they've been thinking about Oreos for 100 years, and me to say, who's got some Oreo ideas is ridiculous. But that essentially is what brainstorming is. So what's the difference between, quote, ideation which is the current term, which was actually uh, coined in the 1600s. So it's, it's actually an old term. But what's the difference between brainstorming and ideation? Or is there a difference? And what are ideation techniques anyway? What are those? Anybody know? 
Well, they both start with problems, but it could be more rigorous about how you define the problem. You could have questions. Uh, because of time, uh, we'll cut to the chase here in terms of the answer. There's really a one-word answer about how ideation is different than, than quote, brainstorming, and that one-word answer is stimuli. It's about using stimuli to trigger the brain to make new connections and new ideas. Okay? So if you, if you get to the essence of creativity, what do we got? We got this thing plus that thing equals what? A new thing. <laughs> I mean, it's really that simple. You sort of mash this thing with that thing and you get a new thing for the most part. Uh, the Chips Ahoy, when we did that assignment, what did we mash together? We mashed together a Chips Ahoy cookie with desserts, that was the stimuli, and that led to a brownie Chips Ahoy, yes, and that's become a huge success with them. Now, might you say that's obvious and simple? Yes, it is, but it, who said it had to be difficult and hard? Sometimes the best ideas are simple, right? The challenge was how do you manufacture this, just so you know. Put a layer of brownie inside the chocolate chip cookie, right? Anybody why, by the way, just while we're on it, anybody know why the brownie chips ahoy is their most profitable skew? Anybody know? Because people like brownies, that's in terms of volume, but in terms of the cost of goods, why is the brownie chips ahoy the, the, the most profitable skew they have? Anybody know? What's that? Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of there. That layer of brownie meant they could put in less chocolate chips. Less chocolate chips are the most import, uh, expensive part of the cookie. Okay, all right. So what I'm going to do with you guys today is I'm going to share some of these ideation techniques with you and also some ideation strategies as we move along. All right, so um, let me first give you a context. Uh, when I wrote my first book, it was 99% inspiration. It came out in 1993, so a long time ago. I went back and read it, that book, two years later. What was my reaction when I went back and read that book? Anybody know? I was actually surprised that it was quite good. <laughs> have, have, any of you, have, you, have any of you been there where you go back and you read something you wrote two years ago or something? You say, you know, I, this was pretty good. So I was surprised at that, actually. Who wrote this? Yeah, who, who wrote this? Brilliant. Um, but what I discovered was I had missed a key organizing principle behind the 180 pages or 200 pages in that book, and that was that there is a that you can categorize different ideation techniques. And those categories that we've identified uh, and sort of shared with the, the world are there are a whole bunch of techniques around what? Questioning, which is what you alluded to at the beginning. So there are a whole bunch of techniques around questioning. There are four of these, by the way. There are a bunch of techniques around visuals. So there are a whole bunch of visual techniques, right? There are a bunch of techniques, and these were pioneered by the company Synectics in the late 1950s, around metaphors or associations. What's a metaphor or association? It's how this thing is like that thing, or analogs, comparisons. It doesn't matter what you call them. OK, so there's a whole group of techniques around that. And then finally, there's a sort of all-in bucket, where what I call fantasy and role play and really out there techniques. So we've got these four categories of techniques. And I'm going to share a bunch of those with you today. And you use them for what? For different purposes. OK? So if you have a strategy session, you'll be heavy into the questioning area, probably. If you're in a new product, you'll be more in the fantasy area, for the most part, and metaphors, and even visuals. All right? So that's what we're up to today. Um, I want to, <laughs> I want to, um, talk about, I want to show you an example. Um, in our work, we get strange calls all the time, and, 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 and also scary calls, okay? So we got a call from one of the big three automakers, and they said, can you help us invent a new sales forecasting system? And so what did I say? Love to, yes, thinking what? There may be math involved, right? And I'm freaking out, okay? <laughs> and I, you know, because they're sending me all these HBR articles with, you know, the sum of symbols and all this sort of stuff. And I'm going, first of all, why did they call me? And secondly, what the heck am I going to do with these senior executives for a day to invent a new sales forecasting system for their, for their, for their company? So what we did, um, we. Uh, 
<laughs> we tried a bunch of stuff, by the way. This one was the big winner, and that's why I'm sharing with. So the question was, how do we, how do we invent a new what? Sales, forecasting, what? System, thank you. You can jump right in here, guys. Okay. All right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got seven words, okay? Sometimes when you do this work, it's helpful to look at the words because the words have both opportunities and what? Constraints. And sometimes you want to question the words themselves and think of other options for those words in order to open up your thinking. So one of these seven words up here was the key to a breakthrough idea. Anybody want to take a guess as to what one of those seven words might be? Which one was it, do you think? Take a shot at it. We invent a new sales forecasting system. Which one do you think it was? Forecasting. It was not forecasting. It was not sales. What's that? Inven it was not invent. <laughs> how do we, I'm sorry, yeah, how do we, so could, it's not we. What? It's not system. It's not new. It's not how. <laughs> it's not do. It was A. It was A. Yes. Why does it have to be one system? Right? Why does it have to be one system? And as soon as we thought of that, we said, oh my gosh, we'll have marketing do a sales forecasting system. We'll have manufacturing do a sales forecasting system. We'll have the dealers do their own sales, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened then? They each did, because they each had different needs for their sales forecasting system, marketing versus sale versus et cetera, OK? So what happened? So they all generated their own systems. And then over time, what did we do? We assessed how well they did assessing what the actual sales were and integrated these to create a more dynamic and successful and efficient and useful, quote, sales forecasting system, OK? So the reason I shared that example, A, to get you to be humble to start, no, well, it wasn't that. Um, it was because we are often constrained by the words and how we define a challenge. So let me give you another example of that. We, we were called by Black & Decker. Um, I can mention that. Anything I'm going to mention today has been cleared by the by the clients, and I've written in the books, et cetera, et cetera. They called us up. It was another one of these strange calls. Not strange. Actually, this one wasn't that strange. But it was the ironing division. So what did they ask us to help them do? Invent a new, by the way, these are not trick questions. These are, these are designed to be pretty easy, frankly, OK? So how do we invent what? A new what? Uh, thank you. Oh my god, we're cooking. So a new iron, OK? Did we go into the challenge with that? Problem definition or framing? No. Why not? I mean, that's what they asked us to do. And we said, yes, we'll help you do that. But we didn't go in with that, that frame. Why not? Because we wanted to be open. If I say iron to you, what do you get? Iron. You get an iron. <laughs> what, you, now we're moving, right? When I say iron, that, what do you get? You, it's, this, it's this thing with a handle, it's got that metal plate in it, it's got holes in it, the water comes out, you know, it's, it, it's got a, a cord. We all know what an iron is. So, to, so frankly, if you're doing an ideation session, you have to spend the first two hours just breaking up people's thought patterns and thought forms and icons about an, what an iron is, right? And so we define the challenge differently. How do we define it? If, it, if it's an iron here, what's a broader way to define that challenge? Yes, and that's what we did. So how do we invent new what? Not iron. <laughs> no. <laughs> how do we invent a new anti-wrinkle device? OK? Because that gets to what you just said about the benefit, right? It's an anti-wrinkle device. Now, are, is this pedantics? Is this just semantics? Is this uh, just not useful, or is this useful? You're reframing or, or expanding the possibilities. You're moving beyond the habitual mind into other possibilities about what this could be. You're moving beyond the iconic uh, representation of what an iron is to more broad possibilities, right? And 
Actually, we went even broader. We got the client to go even broader. We, we said, how do we invent new garment care devices? OK, all right. And that's how we frame the challenge. So for you guys, whether you're software developers, whether you're partnering, whether you're selling, whatever it is, it's, it's often important to make sure that you frame the challenge correctly, or, in, or you might say even more creatively. OK, so that's critical. By the way, I noticed that many of you are taking notes on this. And you're obviously, feel free to take notes. But I'm gonna, I'll send you how-to sheets on any of the techniques I covered today. And so you know, two months from now, when you, when you, when you want to do the questioning assumptions technique or whatever it is, you can pull out this thing and it says, step one, you know, get non-permanent markers so you don't mark up the walls. You know, I mean, that's how, that's how <laughs> basic these things are. Okay? They're really recipe cards, recipe cards, right, uh, for doing these techniques. So uh, don't worry about the how-tos of these. I'll send you these. OK? All right. So this whole world of questioning is important. And, and there are three techniques that we use primarily for this work. And they're often in the strategy area. But um, one of the techniques um, is a questioning assumptions technique. And this is particularly good for strategy, right? You, you may often find that you could spend, spend three months developing new software or something. And then after that three months, you say, wait a second. We solved the wrong problem. We were working on the wrong thing. We, really, we asked this question. We really should have asked that question. And one way to get there is question the assumptions. Okay? So, and forgive me, I'm, I'm using common examples because I think they're more memorable and sometimes more fun. Uh, my, my business partner, Gary Fraser, who's named Market of the Year by, by Brand Week, for the work he did creating a new toothpaste for Unilever. He was an employee at the time. And he created Mentadent toothpaste. I don't know if anybody, the people from overseas may not recognize it. It became a $200 million brand in the US. And he's fighting Colgate and Crest, right? So two of the, you know, P&G and Colgate, two of the toughest competitors on the planet. Their basic idea was to put baking soda inside of peroxide. Because why? That's a kitchen remedy from the 1900s where you do what? Little baking soda, little peroxide, you brush your teeth, good for your teeth and gums. It's like the poor man's toothpaste. Tasted what? Yuck. Yuck. Terrible, awful, but it really worked because it released oxygen and it was good for the health in, uh, of, your, of the gums in particular. So they had this idea and they said, what do they do? We're going to encapsulate the peroxide inside the baking soda and we'll make it taste good and we'll have this big hit, right? And so they did that. Um, and they had their chemists working on it for several years, and they thought they had finally solved the challenge. So what did they do? They did what's called a ship test. A ship test is you make a product, you send it around the country in trucks, make sure everything's OK, stability, all the rest. Summer, Georgia, probably 130 degrees inside the truck. What happened when the driver opened the back of the truck? toothpaste everywhere. It had reacted because of the heat and exploded out the backs of the toothpaste tubes, right? So what do you do at that point? You give up. We can't do it. No. What they did was they questioned the assumption that toothpaste has to what? Come in a tube. Now the thing about questioning assumptions is they're some of your most, most, most basic assumptions that you can question. If, you're in the, if you want to be in the hotel business, what's a very basic assumption? You have to have hotel rooms to rent. I mean, that's a pretty basic assumption, right? Does Airbnb have hotel rooms to rent? No, they don't. OK? So it's sometimes by questioning the most basic assumptions that you can get these breakthrough ideas. In his case, when they questioned assumption, toothpaste had to come in a tube. They came up with a dual dispenser. The baking soda and peroxide met on the, on the toothbrush itself. When you brushed your teeth, it combined and gave you the chemical reaction then. But they spent three years doing the wrong thing, in a sense, because they assumed toothpaste had to come in a tube. Okay, So it's really important um, to make sure you're solving the right problem. And one way to do that is to do the, quote, questioning assumptions technique. So if you, do, if you have a challenge, just sit down and write down 20 assumptions. It's going to be worth it an hour. So what if nothing comes out of it? But, but frankly, it's worth an hour, because you might spend six months working on an application where you didn't question an assumption, and you might have. OK? So that's the questioning assumptions technique. Is it simple? It is simple. It's not always that easy, though. 
if I said, what are the assumptions about a chair? Just give them to me. Throw them out. What are some assumptions about a chair? Has to have a seat. Four legs. A back. Lifts you off the floor. Now, this is interesting because some of the most basic assumptions don't appear when you do this technique to maybe the 10th or 12th or 20th. Uh, one of the most basic assumptions about a chair is for sitting in, you know, and sometimes that doesn't come out right away. But all those assumptions you just said have been questioned. Can you have a chair with three legs? Two legs? One leg? No legs? It's a beanbag chair, right? Can you have a chair without a back? Can you have a chair that's not stable? It's designed to fall down, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you do these questioning assumptions techniques. OK? All right, simple, simple, simple. Another version of this is 20 questions. We don't have time to get into that. It's just instead of saying, OK, let me come up with 20 ways to define it. How do we do what? How do we do this? How do we, how do we, how do we, how do we? You do 20 questions, and you'll find that you get uh, really some cool ideas that you wouldn't have thought of. And you'll find, at the end of the day, if you have to go into your boss, if you were an employee situation, right? Uh, versus a stakeholder, uh, you will have thought about it in a much deeper way because you've talked about these 20 things, these 20 questions or 20 assumptions. OK, the last technique I want to give you, um, this is one of those strange calls we got. Uh, anybody heard of Catholic Knights Insurance Company? Catholic Knights Insurance Company. Everybody, anybody heard of that company? There's no reason you should have. It's. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's about a $100 million company based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They've since changed the name. Um, they had called me after my first book came out, so this was quite a while ago. And they, they were rigorous about the quality movement. And Black Belt, actually, Black Belt wasn't even invented at the time, but they were extremely rigorous about the quality thing. And the conclusion they came to, right, was now that we've gotten as efficient as we can be on the quality thing, we need what? Ideas. We need ideas to help us grow the business. So they had read my, my first book, and they called me up and they said, and this is the call, yeah, hi, we read your book, we have a book club on it. Um, can you help us uh, sell more life insurance to Catholics? And you know, it's one of these, who is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> who, who's calling me, right? Um, and I said, really? <laughs> uh, of course, my first question is what? Why Catholics? You know, I mean, how about Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and the rest of it? You know, no. They they said we only sell to Catholics. I said really? Yeah. They said we've been sued by all those groups, but our charter initially has held up, so we only sell life insurance to Catholics. <laughs> okay. Can you help us do that? What do I say? Love to, <laughs> right? Love to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So I flew out there, and we did a whole bunch of creative stuff. This one was the one that, like, like the sales, this one was the one that was the big hit. So here's our challenge, right? How do we, how do what? We do what? Sell, yes. More what? Life insurance. To whom? To Catholics. OK. All right. OK. So this is the problem redefinition technique. It's one you can use for anything. It does not matter if you're trying to sell insurance to Catholics or if you're trying to do something else. Uh, you can use it for anything. All you need to do is what? You need a subject, a verb, and an object. Now, I could have picked life insurance, but I picked Catholics, OK? All right? And what do you do with this technique? You come up with other options under each column. OK? So who else could the we be? Typically, we is what? The sales force. Their sales force is selling life insurance to Catholics. Who else could the we be? What's that? Em employees, you said? Em employees could certainly. Yes, who else? Could be churches, sure. Yeah, again, these are not trick questions, guys. You can just throw them out. You know what I mean? It could be anything, right? Who else could sell their life insurance? What's that? The, uh, the employee families, yes. Employee families could help us sell. Who else? What's that? Church goers in general could help us. Yes, of, of, very good. Who else? Jews and Muslims, yes. 
motivated Jews and Muslims, I guess. Why not? Uh, I, this would be a bit of a stretch, but maybe they could help us sell Catholic life insurance. All their Catholic friends, yes. Uh, we'll just take two more. Who else could the we be? Could it be board members? Yes. Could it be uh, friends of Catholics? We had employee f friends? Yes, et cetera, et cetera. OK, uh, I'll just write. Anybody else before we move on? OK. All right, so, we, so you generate a whole bunch of these possibilities, right? OK, sell. Other options or words that we, we could talk about for sell. It could be, how about co-market? Uh, buy, OK. How about giveaway? Uh, yes, sub uh, pr uh, yes, subscribe, if you will. Yes, what else? Convince, yes. Convince, incentivize, right? Incentivize. One more. Promote, whatever, OK? So now you're coming up with different options for the word sell. What? How do you love? We're going to get, get funky with the Catholics here, but we'll go, we'll go with it. OK. How do you love? OK. And finally, in the third column, Catholics. Is a Catholic a Catholic a Catholic? Depends. <laughs> um, so let's think more specifically and or broadly about Catholics. So help me with this. Who else could the cat? Is it Catholics? What, what do, can we segment it is maybe the way to say it. Irish Catholics, yes. What else? How about lapsed Catholics? OK. But they're still Catholics, right? They could still buy the insurance, right? Who else? Practicing Catholics, certainly. Who else? New Catholics, yes? How about nuns? Are they Catholics? Last time I checked, they were priests, OK. Uh, who else? Could it be grandparents? Grandparent Catholics? Yes, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Uh, we had Irish Hispanic Catholics, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. OK? All right. So you get all these words. So now what do you do? Now what do you do? Do you think? Uh, this is like Mad Libs or Chinese menu time, yes? Some of, I'm probably dating myself here with some of these things. Um, let's pick three here. Let's pick three. What three do you want? Pick some odd ones or interesting ones. Okay, we're going to pick that. Okay, another one? Employees, okay. And a third one? Churches, thank you. All right, let's do the same over here. Pick three. Love, okay, another one? Convince, and finally? Giveaway, thank you. And let's do three over here. What do we got? Irish Catholics, yes. What else? Nuns, and finally, what? Practicing, okay. All right, so then what do you do? You read the sentences that have been just been created. So how do we get the churches to convince people, um, to convince practicing Catholics to buy what? Catholic Knights Life Insurance. OK? Is that an idea? Sort of, kind of, maybe. We have to think about it, right? We've got to push it, push it. Well, how would you get the churches? Why would the churches do it? What would the churches do? Yeah, they incentivize. Thank you. Yes, one, just so you know, one of the bigger ideas that came out of this was to actually replace churches with schools. And they went to parochial schools. And, and, and if they could get a certain percentage of the, the families to sign up with Catholic Knights Insurance, they donated what? Free sports equipment and computers. OK? So that was a big deal. Um, how do we get employees to give away life insurance to, oh, did I screw it up, to Irish Catholics? OK? Maybe you could do sort of a giveaway program. You will, we'll insure you for the first year, and then you have to pay after that. Might be a program. And then finally, how do we get the Jews and the Muslims to, oh, I'm sorry. How do we, I screwed it up, right? So how did, we did the churches. Oh, I didn't do love. Did I screw it up? Yeah. OK. How do we get the churches to love the nuns? No. How do we get the churches to love for practicing Catholics? How do we get the Jews and the Muslims to convince uh, the nuns to buy Catholic Knights Life Insurance. 
Now, did I say they would all work? No, no. But they could, it could. The, the point of this work is what? What's the key about ideation, the one word I said when we started this? Stimuli. This is about triggering your brain to think new thoughts. So it's not that the answer is going to be here. It's that it's going to trigger your brain to think new thoughts. Okay? So if you had 10 of these in each column, right, how many ways could you redefine this challenge? Many. How many? Yes. How many combinations do you have if you have 10 in each column? 1,000, yes. I've asked this of financial planners, and they, nobody knew. I'm like, boy, this is troublesome. It's 10, it's 10 to the third, right? It's 10 times 10 times 10, or you have 1,000 different ways to define this challenge, right? OK. So would you do the 1,000? Probably not. But the point here is what? If you're in, in this world, where every day you're thinking, how do we invent a new Oreo cookie? How do I sell life insurance to Catholics? How do I design this new computer, gr computer program? Whatever it is, when you have that frame of that thing, it's hard to think of new ideas, because that's what you're thinking about all the time. So these triggers will help you reinvent how you think about the idea. This is called the problem redefinition technique, how you define that challenge, right? And then come up with ideas. So what could you use this for? What could you use this technique for? The answer is anything. It's anything, right? Because what? As long as you have what? A subject, verb, and object. OK? All right. Let me back up and ask you guys, that with your coworkers, if you're a manager, how's it worked when you said, I'd like you to bring me some new ideas about something? How does that work, generally? It generally works poorly. That's been our experience, that it hasn't worked well at all. And why is that? It's because it's like saying, who's got any new Oreo ideas? You know, it doesn't help people to say, bring me new ideas. Would it help to say, I'd like you to go think about how we get the Jews and Muslims to convince nuns to buy our life insurance? Is that a better question, in a sense, in terms of generating ideas? It is actually better, because the specificity you can lock, on, you can lock onto so as managers, or even coworkers, or um, you know, uh, what's our word instead of employees? Stakeholders. As stakeholders, we can get our teams to be radically creative by what? By asking them some of these interesting questions. OK? Um, is this simple, by the way? It is. <laughs> None of the stuff I'm going to share with you today is rocket science. You can, we just learned this in five minutes, right? Yes? Well, why does it, I mean, why does that take practice? Oh, in terms of triggering the ideas, yeah. It, it does, it does. It, it takes a certain flexibility, or the agile mind, if you will. Um, now, what you can do is you, as a manager, can create these things on your, on your own, and then do them with your team, send them out, do them for yourself, whatever. By the way, we had, um, I, went, I went to Dartmouth, and every year they call up and they say, would you, uh, take an intern, and you know we reluctantly agree. But in this case, the guy was a computer science major. Because it's a w it's we have to spend so much time, you know, making sure they have a good experience, right? And that's you know we don't have time to do that, frankly. We're not big enough, so we're you know. Uh, but anyway, this guy really insisted because we said we're we're a marketing innovation agency. Why would we want, you know, a computer programmer? Uh, he was a computer science major at Dartmouth. But he really pushed, and so he relented. So what did we have him do the month that he interned with us? We had him do this. We had him write a computer program for this, right? So what you do is you type in all these things, and it'll randomly spit out the combinations. This is a pretty simple thing, right? So could Kintone somehow do this? I'm thinking they probably could, maybe. I don't know. I don't know the software and the tools well enough. But, but these random combinations are cool. You just you put in the 10 in each column. You hit buttons, but every, you know, every time you hit a button, it'll spit out 10 different combinations. OK? Um, by the way, on our website, which is growth-engine.com, and I will send you this, um, there is a section called Idea Tools. And um, we've got that tool in there. 
you can't miss it. It's the only tool under idea tools. So, <laughs> so it's very hard to miss. Now we just got a new website. We got a Java thing. We're hoping it works, but you know, if, if it doesn't, maybe one of you guys could fix it for us. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we need another intern, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay? All right. Everybody got it, right? Simple. How many might use this thing? Right? Yeah, it's cool, right? It's so, I just, it's so powerful. You know what happened to Catholic Knights Insurance Company? No, they, they did rebrand, but not because of this. But in terms of sales, you know what their sales increase was? Because what? They were rigorous. These guys were anal about all these. They did thousands of combinations, right? And so what happened? Th this was unsolicited. The marketing, the CMO wrote me a, six months later and said, we have increased our sales by 52% which I don't know if you know, but that's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal to increase $100 million company, increase by 52% in six months. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's amazing, right? Uh, did we undercharge? Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Definitely undercharge for our services on that one. Okay. All right. So that's the whole questioning thing. Um, because we talked about We've got superheroes talking about in our, the Kintone thing here, right? On the sheets out there, you're a hero, you're a superhero. I hadn't planned to do this one, but I thought I'd share this one. Um, this is in the world of fantasy. I just thought I would share this quickly. There is a technique called great thinkers technique, uh, where essentially you invite great thinkers into your ideation sessions, okay? And the way you do that is you have people role play those people. So da Disney, Da Vinci, Einstein, et cetera. Um, You'd be surprised. It sounds kind of flaky, but it's not. It gives people permission, especially the introverts, by the right. Yeah. What's with the deal with the introverts in an ideation session? You never hear from them. You know, it's really hard. And yet, they're even though they're drooling in the corner over there, they have often really some great ideas, and you you, you miss those sometimes. Okay. So, um, we were um, last week. We were with the con c comptrollers office of the state of New York, teaching, teaching their auditors how to be more creative. And I was shocked that they wanted to use creative techniques to invent new what? Audit products. I'm like, what? I, I, don't, I don't get it. They say, yeah, we, we want to invent new things to go audit. Because why? Because it might help the state, right? It might help the state. So we had them, this was totally a shock to me, so I had them role play different people. So if uh, in one case, and by the way, these could be superheroes, as we talked about out front here, superheroes, or they could be just, quote, famous people that are alive, or they could even be fictional characters, right? So uh, one team, one team uh, role played Huck Finn. And the, the thought was, okay, Huck Finn is now in charge of the comptroller's office for the state of New York. What is Huck Finn? If, if you guys don't know, you all know Huck Finn? If you're from overseas, this is Mark Twain. You know Huck Finn? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what would he want to audit if he were in charge of auditing for this, the controller's office of the state of New York? What might he want to audit? Maybe wildlife and how that works and trends in wildlife and forestry and all that kind of stuff and all the rest. Jim Morrison was one of the great thinkers. If you don't know Jim Morrison, the, the dead guy from the or he's the, the late Jim Morrison from The Doors, yeah, okay. So what might he want to audit? He might want to audit music trends in the state of, of New York. He might also want to audit what? Clubs. Clubs, what else? Drugs. Drugs, yes. Yeah, uh, he, you all may know he died of a drug overdose, right? And so he'd say, yeah, I think we've go, got to go order, audit what? The opium crisis or the, the heroin crisis or whatever, the opiate crisis. And so, so actually that is an idea that they're thinking of pursuing because they realize that if they audit that, they can provide better data about how to deal with that in the state of New York. Okay? So if you have an ideation situation or, or where somebody is too tied into their own point of view, sometimes if you have play the great thinker's game, um, that person, A, if they're an introvert, they may come alive because they're, they're playing a role, right? Well, I'm Da Vinci now, and Da Vinci would say such and such, and, right? Or Disney or whomever it is. Um, so A, it may help the introverts come out, and B, if you have somebody who's taking over the meeting, it may shut them up, or at least get a different point of view, right? 
because you have now permission to say, oh, no, no, it's not you, you're Da Vinci. What would Da Vinci say? Uh, okay. And b by the way, some of this stuff may seem ridiculous and stupid, yes? But I'm sharing them with you only because they work and they've shown to work. And so you need to uh, create an environment where some of these ridiculous excursions, and I'm going to give you an even more ridiculous one before we end here today, um, they actually work. And so you need to build in permission for these things when you do your ideation uh, or brainstorming or creative sessions with your teams. Okay? What percentage of these will work? About 10%. You were all here when we started like an hour, 45 minutes ago. It's about 10%. Yes? It's about 10%. So this is about failure. So it's OK. By the way, when, if and when you facilitate these techniques with your teams, if something dies an ugly death, so what? What difference does it make? You move on. Who cares? Right? OK, that didn't work. What else do we got? OK? All right. So um, in the fantasy world, um, I want to just share, quickly share two others um, and then give you some guys some concept development techniques. Uh, <clears throat> when I got out of college, um, I, uh, you know, I thought it was great, right? You know, cum laude guy from an Ivy League school. I wanted to get in advertising. They were not really hiring at the time. You know, the economy was really bad. And so I'm living at home. My mother is what? Y'all wanted me to take out the garbage and get a job, right? Have we had this experience? I hope you haven't, because it's a real drag. So, and my father had been in advertising, and he was sort of a, an original madman, um, died at a very early age. <laughs> um, and he had, but he had connections in the industry. So what do you do? You go talk to all his connections, right? Well, here it is six months in the process. I've talked to all his connections, and I still don't have a job, right? So what do you do? Besides freak out, I should have created my own. If this had been 20, 30 years later, I would have created my own job. I <coughs> would have said the heck with it. Um, but I still wanted to get a job in advertising. So what I did um, at sort of the depth of my depression, I, be I used what's called the wish technique or the fantasy technique. And so I began to wish for impossible situations. So for me, it was impossible that what? I could meet with the top 36 CEOs of the ad agencies in, in New York City. I live in Connecticut, so these were all New York ad, ad agencies. That was a wish. I want to meet with 20, 30, 40 of the CEOs or presidents of all the top New York agencies. Why did I want to meet with them? Because I had been to HR, and HR always said no. And I said, well, maybe if I'll see a CEO, maybe one of these guys will like me and hire me. Okay? So that was a wish. Another wish. Another wish is I want to see them quickly right away. Why? Because I'm living at home being, and being yelled at by my mother, right? <laughs> so, so I want to I meet with these guys right away, yeah? Um, et cetera, et cetera. I had a whole bunch of wishes. Um, and, I, and we call this kind of a success footprint. And you guys can do this for if you're designing a program, if you're doing a, whatever you're doing. You can start at the end state. You can start at the end with the wish. So this is the perfect solution to this challenge I'm working on. This is the perfect solution. And what are the qualities or characteristics or features of that perfect solution? Do you have the solution? No, you don't have the solution yet. You just have the characteristics of that final solution, if you will, not final solution, of the best solution, let's call it that, OK? The characteristic of, like me, I got to see the top 36 executives. I got to do it right away. It was a lot of fun, et cetera, et cetera. Those were my wishes, OK? So that was the wish. And then I came up with an idea to do that. The, the, the idea was called Jogging for Jobs. Um, jogging was big at the time, believe it or not. And um, it was a trend, a new trend. That's how old I am. It was a new trend, <laughs> OK? And, um, and so what I did was I, sa I created an event. I put an ad in the New York Times. I said, if you're looking for a job in advertising, give me a call. I got 150 calls of people like myself who couldn't get a job. They said, do you have a job? I said, no, I don't have a job. They're like, well, <laughs> but, but, but I want to do this event where we're all going to run to all the New York agencies and drop off our resumes. And we'll call ourselves the go-getters, and it's jogging for jobs, and it'll be this cool thing. What? OK. But I, so I had the organizational meeting in, at, at the Williams Club in, in New York City. 
uh, of the 150 calls, I got about 40 people that showed up. So I said, cool, we're going to have this big event. Uh, the key to this was what? The publicity, the press. So I called up friends of my, fa my late father who, who had known of him, right? I called these people up, I'm doing this thing, blah, 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 blah. So we got the advertising columnist from New York, New York Times to show up, and he wrote a story about it, okay? Okay, so then a week later, we're at the actual event. I had sent notices to all the, uh, the agencies saying we're going to be there at from 1020 to 1040. Because what? We're seeing all 36 agencies in New York City over three days. So we can only be there for 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so I did that. So of the, of the 30 or 40 people that came to the organizational meeting, how many showed up to actually run? Six. It was really embarrassing. Uh, you know. So here, the advertising columnist from the New York Times shows up again. He's doing a follow-up story on the go-getters and jogging for jobs in New York City. I was like, oh my god. And so he wrote this story about the go-getters. These are the true go-getters. Only six of the 40 showed up. Okay. And then, but we had the AP wire service. There were more reporters there than there were people <laughs> running. It's true. We had Chuck Scarborough, if you know New York, he's in the New York News. Chuck Scarborough was there. He was out on the, he was running with a guy with a camera. We had the AP wire service, all these press, and there's six of us, right? It's, it's embarrassing. But so we ran to all these places. We dropped off resumes. We show up. What's the chairman say at the agency? Oh my God, I love these people. This is the future of our business. Of course we'll, you know, so he came in, we're getting free product. It was the three most self-affirming days in my life I think I ever had. Everywhere we went. And I'd be with the chairman of Wells Rich and Green or Ogilvy and Mather, and I'd say, yeah, uh, sorry, um, we got to go. But, we'll, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch, you know, what, that kind of thing. So the net of it is all six of us got, well, actually five of us got jobs out of the six guy, after he met all these people, said, I don't want to be this, in this business <laughs> anyway. Okay, so he didn't go, okay. <laughs> he didn't go in the business. But, um, but we all got jobs out of it. So what was the point of that telling that overly long story? Why did I tell that story? It was the power of the wish, right? It was starting with this end in mind, this end state of all possibilities, wishing for the impossible. And so you can do this with your teams. If you're developing a software, you're do whatever it is you're doing, you can start by wishing for the impossible and then figuring out how to get there. And that's a really effective way to design processes, systems, and all the rest. And we do this all the time with our clients. Uh, and what we'll do is not only wish for ourselves, but we'll also wish for customers, what is their wish, or consumers, or whatever it is, okay? All right, the key to this, as you really push the wish technique, is wish for the impossible. The way you wish for the impossible, uh, and again, the jogging for jobs thing wasn't impossible, but I, I didn't go to truly impossible. What would you do to get really impossible? The trick is to violate laws of nature. Just not perversions, but you know, just violate laws of nature in order to break the rules. So you know, you can disappear, or you can uh, you know travel through time. Those are those are the impossible wishes, and that's where you can really get some cool stuff. Yes, question. Now, this is that one from Ken. He's telling me yes. And he said, yeah. Is that a wonderful example, or what? I mean, I love that. They violated the, you know, there are eight days a week, and so you had a morning edition, an evening edition, or a, is that? Oh, you did, eight days, oh, isn't that great? Thank you, and what, uh, what uh, newspaper was this? Star Ledger in New Jersey, terrific. Thank you for sharing that, that's a great story. Um, okay, so what do we got? We got these four topic areas. One is what over here? The four classes of creative techniques. What was this one? Questions. <laughs> Remember, we had three techniques over here with questions. What were the three techniques? Yeah. No, what were the three techniques? Questioning assumptions was one. What was the second one? Problem redefinition, which is this one. What was the third one? 20 questions. <laughs> okay. All right. In the fantasy area, in the fantasy area, what techniques have we hit so far? Yes, and what else? And wishing. Very good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So um, I want to I want to share you with you sort of one last technique because I promised in this write-up that I'd share five techniques with you guys. Right. By the way, this is a toolkit. Yes, this is a toolkit. And I wanted to share this because I want you to know you should never feel that you can't come up with an idea for something. By the way, if you're, has anyone ever been in an impossible situation at work? Meaning, your boss or your coworker um, has asked you to create something and you're in an impossible situation. Impossible means you don't have the money, the time, the talent, whatever it is, right? The resources to go do this thing, and yet you've been asked to do it. Has anyone ever been in that situation? If you haven't, you will be, okay? Just so you know, okay? So, what do you do in that situation besides freak out, right? Because it's impossible. That is a good time to do questioning assumptions. Why? because it's the way you frame the challenge. It's the assumptions you've made that made it impossible. So if you're, this is a life, important life lesson here, I think. If you're ever in an impossible situation, right, do the questioning assumptions technique, and that could be the breakthrough for you. Okay? All right. So um, I want to share with you one last, uh, if you will, fantasy technique. We're not going to do metaphors and idea hooks, and uh, we're not even going to do visuals, collaging. Um, and picture prompts and all those kind of different techniques. Um, actually, let me, <laughs> because I'm thinking of it, because there, there are a fair number of uh, women here, maybe I'll share this one, just because I think it's kind of fun. So we had been asked by Clairol, it had been bought by Procter & Gamble by then, to help them invent a new hair color, okay? So how do you get insights? And you might use this technique even if you're trying to get insights into customer needs, right? How do you get insights about what women uh, want or might want in their hair color? What are some research, some creative research techniques you might use? Anybody? Look at what they wear. I love that idea. What else? What else could you do to try to get insights about uh, women and what their unmet needs are, or what their wishes, or anything around hair color? You could ask them, oh my gosh, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? You know, you laugh, but, but often we go around these things and we never ask the customer, right, or consumer. So thank you for that. What else? What else could you do? What? Oh, I love that. Say, say that again so everybody can hear that. And, and why, because why, I love what you just said. Why did you say that? Because I think it's a really interesting insight. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's a wonderful comment, right? It's a wonderful comment um, to, to sort of get back to that, that realm of naivete, naivete. You know, I do a lot of radio and webinar interviews and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes the interviews ask me, they say, can you teach people how to be creative? And what do I say to that? I say it's a really a bad question. Because we're all born creative, right? This kid is born, you know, if you can remember back, you know, you had, you know, purple hair and you were, you know, frying it up in the saucepan, you know, I mean, all these crazy things we were doing as a kid, right? That were so creative and so wonderful, right? And there's a famous longitudinal study where kids at, at five or six were testing at the 98 percentage in terms of creativity, right? And then by the time they got to be 12, it was down to like 12 percent, right? Okay, so, so the point here is what? That we're sort of born creative, we have that. So, the, so that young point of view is often a really good source of creativity. So what we did, I'll just cut this short, what we did, um, we did, it's the term now is ethnography, if you haven't heard that term. It's based on the, um, the uh, uh, principle of sort of ex having people experience things in their environment, right? So we went to people's homes, the women, you know, were not naked in the shower or anything like this, but we were there with them, watching them, and having them talk through every single step they would go through, for instance, to color their hair. And so that was extremely valuable. Um, when we were doing some work with Prestone in a new combination car wax and cleaner, uh, what did we do? What would you do if that were the case, if you wanted to research that product? You could bring them into a focus group, right? But what else could you do? 
You could watch them do it. Yes, this is not rocket science. It's simple, right? So what we did was we did actually get a focus group facility, but we recruited guys with dirty cars to come. We gave them the thing. We videotaped them, and we watched them do everything, open up the, open up the, the thing. You know, what is it, how does it work? But went through every step in immense detail. And what do you discover? And this is true of development, too, right? Software development. What do you discover? You had made assumptions about this. You thought you had told them this. You thought they knew how to take the cap off, <laughs> right? You th all these sort of assumptions you had made, but until you see them actually use the product, you don't really know, OK? So for you guys, if obviously, this is lean innovation work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you can get you know, the minimum vial product, if you can get people using this thing, it'll be really important, OK? So what do we do to get insights uh, with the women and their hair colors? Um, what we did was, and this is a visual technique, we did before and after collages of how they felt before they colored their hair and how they, and it really needed this, and how they felt after they colored their hair. So the women may know this, but this was a shock to me. Um, what did the collages look like before women had colored their hair? Anybody know? Anybody have a? It looked like Armageddon. It was unbelievable. It was like this dystopia of it's just it was it was they were so dark and so depressed, you know I couldn't believe it. And then what about on after they had colored their hair? Oh my God, it's people running in fields and sunshine and bright lights and all all this kind of crazy stuff. You know my wife at the time and we had more money back then I guess, but she was out spending three hundred dollars to get her hair colored in New York City. I'm like, what the hell? What are, you, are you kidding me? My haircuts cost 20 bucks. You're, you're spending $300 to get your hair? She said, no, no, it's really After I did this work, as a male, I kind of understood. Because this one woman said to me, I'll never forget it, when, when I saw this collage. I said, what's going on here? And she said, you know, um, hair color allows me to help the world. I said, what? Is this, wh what are you talking about? She said, if I don't feel good about myself, and hair color makes me feel good about myself, so my, my hair colored right, I don't want to go out in the world, and I don't feel I can give back to the world. So hair color allows me to give back to the world. Oh my god. You know, this is, you know, this is an incredible statement, right? Hair color allows you to change the world. Right? But that's how important this was. And for a male, I finally understood. And so for you guys, these picture techniques can be very powerful for getting at sort of underlying motivations and things that people will not say physically or, or out loud, but it's really what they're thinking. Right? So you can use these projective techniques. Because you might ask somebody and they say, yeah, yeah, that's great. But sometimes the pictures will give you insights that you can't get in, the, in, in any other way. Okay, um, and you know, and there's collaging, and there's magazine rip and wraps, and by the way, it, do, 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 has anyone ever had a naming challenge here? Have you ever had to name a new product or anything like that? Maybe you guys aren't in that position where you have to name stuff. Um, if you do, I'll just tell you, it's really hard. I mean, it's one of the hardest things to do because why? A to get a good name, and then B once you get a good name, what? It's not available. So it's, it's really, really hard. And so I would just say, if you ever have a naming challenge, uh, almost counterintuitively, use pictures. Because pictures can trigger uh, very interesting metaphors, associations. You can get to names you wouldn't have gotten to any other way. Um, OK? Actually, because we're on naming, I'll tell a fun story. Uh, we got time. It's, it's a two-minute story. I think it's worth it, uh, just because it's fun. Uh, we, we were asked by uh, Ben and Jerry's to help them name, we, we asked them, they asked us to help them invent new novelties. So these are not pints, so like bonbons, Ben Ben's, good idea, right? Okay. Anyway, we helped them invent new novelties, right? But they also said we want to spend a half hour trying to name this new strawberry and fudge ice cream. I said, a half hour? What are you talking about? They said, yeah, we only have a half hour in this day's session, by the way, just so you know. They brought in ice cream all day. By the end of the day, I'm like shaking. I was in sugar shock from eating all this ice cream. But anyway, they, they said, we have a half hour to name this new strawberry and fudge ice cream. I said, really? Uh, how long have you been working on it? Three months. 
you've been working on three months, you expect me to get you guys to get this in a half hour? They said, yes. This was their mother of invention, candle and wall. I said, I can't do it. She said, I'm sorry, but you've got to figure it out. All right. So what did I do to get them to think of a new name for the strawberry and fudge ice cream? Did I use a technique? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because what? You need what? What's the one word you need? Stimuli. You need stimuli to trigger the brain. Yes, to make new connections. So what stimuli did I use? The ice cream itself? What, what stimuli did I use? That wasn't it, but what stimuli? We did taste the ice cream, so that was good. How could you trigger a new name of a strawberry and fudge ice cream? Could you use New Yorker cartoons, because Ben and Jerry's is fun? I guess you could. Could you show funky videos of people having fun? I guess you could. You know, but they all seem a little flaky. What does Ben and Jerry's represent? To me, it represented anti-authoritarianism, right? They, they do what? You know, some of their names, if you've seen some of their names, you kind of can't believe that they would name these products some of that they did, uh, like the Saturday Night Live episode, right? Okay, I won't mention it. Unbelievable, but so they're willing to, to be anti-authoritarian and try new stuff, right? So what are anti-authoritarian words? Slang. Slang. So I got slang dictionaries, cut those up, pass those out, use those as triggers. In a half hour, we did get snafu. Strawberries naturally all fudged up, and that's what they launched the name under. Okay? So the point here is stimuli can trigger the, the actions, and you can actually do it fairly quickly when you have to. Okay? All right, so stimuli is key. All right, the last uh, technique I want to share, and then I want to do some strategies, and then we'll have time for questions. The last technique. Um, is the worst idea technique, okay? And this one, again, this one sounds very flaky, but it's not. We've done studies of the effectiveness of different techniques. This technique tends not to generate as many ideas, but at the end of the day, you have higher quality of percentage of breakthrough ideas, okay? So what's the worst idea technique? Might you imagine? Yeah, exactly. You don't come up with good ideas, you come up with bad ideas. Okay? And what do you do? You come up with like 15 or 20 really bad ideas. And if you're facilitating this with your team, you push them to get worse and worse and worse. Well, if you could chain them to a desk, but then you make them naked, but then you start torturing them, you know, you get worse and worse and worse. Now, don't invite HR to these sessions, because, <laughs> you know, they'll freak out, okay? All right? But, you, so you get, you get 20 really bad ideas. Then what do you do? you use it to trigger good ideas. What are the two strategies for turning a bad idea or worst idea into a good idea? Take the opposite. That doesn't really work, but that is one of the strategies. She's absolutely correct. Why doesn't it work? If it's, you know, um, if you're, what's a terrible idea for a soup? Awful idea for a soup. Give me, somebody give me one. A soup. Soup. Sewage and bacon. I love that. I love the sewage and bacon. It's a nice touch, right? What's the opposite of sewage and bacon? Uh, I have no idea, right? I, mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. You know, ham and, ham and uh, I don't know, uh, ham and water. I mean, so the opposite isn't often that interesting, okay? The more interesting and successful strategy is to say, as bad as this is, is there any, anything I can use to trigger a good idea? So if it's sewage and bacon, what, what could that lead to in terms of a soup? Maybe it's super thick cuts of bacon, right? In this, you could say it's in a sewage, but it's, it's in this really, you know, sort of rib sticking thing. You're not using sewage, clearly, but it's, it's this really thick cuts of bacon, and, and that can lead to the idea of what? Chunky soups, which is, of course, already out there, okay? So that's the way this technique works, right? So we were working with um, a large information services company. Um, what's, and they would sell data, okay? So what's the worst idea for them? Give it away. Absolutely, that was the worst possible idea for them, okay? When we explored that technique or that idea, we got the idea, well, maybe they can get a, a better database if they give away part of their data to build a more robust um, <coughs> service with more input 
and then they could charge more money for it. And so that's exactly what they did, and it led to a multi-million dollar division just with that simple, simple worst idea technique, okay? So um, if, uh, when would you use worst idea technique? When might you use it? For what kind of challenges? You could use it for anything, right? But it's particularly good if you have a cynical team or maybe customer service, I'm kidding, but, no, but, but, but you know, a, a team that, you know, not, the, you, know, you know, that kind of situation, right? Um, because why? Come up with a bad idea and a worse idea and a worse and worse and worse. It's almost cathartic for some people who, who are more naturally negative. Negative not in the bad sense of the word, but, uh, you know, lawyers have been trained, if you're writing a contract, what is their training? It's to find area problems or areas of risk, right? And so they've sort of, or bankers, you know, can I get a loan? No. You, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're looking at risk profiles, right? Yeah? And so, so, so for some of those people who've kind of been trained to, to look for the problems, they love this technique. I mean, I did do this technique with 130 bankers one time when I was dying, uh, and, and, and it worked great. Ha, ha, ha. We, could tr you know, we could close the bank at 2 o'clock versus 3 o'clock. Right? We, ha, ha, ha. we could double the ATM fees. You know what I mean? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> and, and, and they love it. And so then what do you do? You come up with all these bad ideas, and then what do you do? You reverse it or, or, or find out. So if it's, um, you know, one of the bad ideas was we'll take all their money without letting them know. Right? I mean, this is the <laughs> ultimate bad idea for a banker, right? So what could that have led to? Absolutely. And what was the technique that Bank of America did? Keep the change, right? They would round it down, keep that change, and put that in a separate account. So that's a bad idea that led to a, you know, a good idea. Okay? All right. So last thing on uh, worst idea technique. It may be politically sensitive to, to do the worst idea. I remember we were doing a session. I can mention it. It was for J&J &J in the pharmaceutical word, world. And you know the worst ideas can get really bad. I won't go into them. We had to expunge, we had a technographer in the room, somebody taking electronic meeting notes. We had to expunge all that before we left the room because if this went out in the world, people say, oh, they're trying to kill babies, you know what I mean, or, or awful things, right? Which, of course, they weren't, but that was the technique. But, but the point here is that sometimes worst idea is politically not appropriate or correct to do. So we actually had that situation with the ASPCA, uh, American Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, they had asked us um, to help them uh, to come up with some ideas to help to encourage New Yorkers to adopt pit bulls, large dogs, and specifically pit bulls. Why was that the creative challenge? It's because uh, the police department uh, was doing a better job of finding drug dealers, and there were often abused dogs as part of the drug dealers, and on and on and on. So all of a sudden, they had this huge influx of big dogs, right? And often mistreated dogs. So they would retrain them and give them love and get them back. But if I went in there and said, let's do the worst idea, it's kind of kind of bad, right? I mean, I don't want to do worst idea with the dogs, you know? I mean, it's already a bad situation, right? So what did we do? We did, we, we just changed it a little bit. We did the silly idea technique. So what's a silly idea for getting people to invent, to, to adopt dogs? What's a silly idea? Get what? A free cop? A free cat. Yeah, that's a silly idea, right? That's cool, right? What's another silly idea? What? They dress them up in tutus, which actually was one of the ideas that uh, became of interest because what? You put them in the what? The Halloween parade, dress them all up, and all of a sudden they become very cute, and now people want to, want to adopt them. What's another silly idea? Uh, how about a virtual adoption? So you don't really adopt them. You just you put, set up a camera and you pretend like you adopt them, right? So you don't have to feed them and they're just there. And what does that do? People actually will fall in love with them if they watch them every day, right? So that was another silly idea. And the final silly idea was, oh, you just run up to somebody and say, would you hold my dog for a second and run away, <laughs> right? So that was a silly idea. But that's the puppy dog clothes. You let them, you let them take them for walks without having to own the dog, okay? All right, so that's the silly idea. 
So we've hit, what techniques have we hit? We hit the three questioning techniques. We hit a couple of wish techniques, which is what? The wishing and great thinkers. And we also just hit this, these sort of two techniques. You're getting a bonus here, a BOGO, right? Um, what's the bonus? So we did what? Worst idea and silly idea. Okay, so the point here is you have this toolkit of techniques. I will send you the how-tos on all of this stuff. And I would just encourage you to use them. If you do them poorly, does it matter? No, because it's better than saying, got any ideas, got any more ideas. Will they work? If you do enough of them, they will work. Even if you facilitate them poorly, it's better than saying, who's got some ideas with your teams? Okay? And you, can, and you don't have to do these all day. You can order pizza and do the worst idea technique for a half hour, have fun, and I guarantee you'll get some cool ideas. Okay? So that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of techniques. All right? Any question on any of those techniques? By the way, you may love one or two of these, and you may not like any, some of the others. It doesn't matter. If you get one technique out of that today, I'm happy. You got one that you're going to use to get new ideas. That's fantastic. Okay? So those are techniques. Any questions on those? Are they simple? They're incredibly simple, right? These are not, this is not rocket science, right? We worked really hard to make these things really simple, which they are. Okay. I want to end um, in the few minutes and then have some, some time for questions on sort of strategies um, for, um, for growing your businesses. Um, we, we're asked to do a fair amount of strategy work, which is, which is really, really fun. And so we've invented some new stuff, um, and I'll share those with you. If anyone wants to know more about them, I can tell you. One of the strategies or techniques, sort of a creative technique at getting at different strategies, is something we call disruptive wargaming. It's one we created uh, probably three or four years ago. Um, you probably have heard of wargaming, which is role playing. You sort of role play the competition and try to figure out where they're going to go to build their business, et cetera, et cetera. What is disruptive wargaming? Let's say you're in the insurance business, and we just we did the, one of these earlier uh, this year um, uh, for an insurance company, right? So, who are their classic competitors? You know, Allstate, State Farm, Progressive, whatever, right? Geico. Who could be disruptive competitors for them? Who could disrupt their businesses? Banks? How about Amazon, Google, or Walmart? You can almost say, who's a disruptor? You can almost always say Amazon, because they'll, they'll do anything, those guys, right? So Amazon, Google, or Walmart, right? If Amazon entered the insurance business, could it change? Oh my gosh, right? You wish they would. If Walmart entered the insurance business, would it change? Could, right? How many, they have 100 million people going through their doors each week, right? So, oh my gosh, if they enter the insurance business, this could be a very different proposition for this company, right? So for you guys, um, it's, I just share this because it's been a powerful technique for our clients to come up with new strategies, new growth strategies, and also to anticipate moves by the competition. For one insurance company, they actually anticipated an acquisition by their competitors and they were ready for that. So it can be very powerful stuff. And I just share that as a strategy. If, you, if you're in, because in my write-up there, I said I'd talk about some different strategies for growth. So it's called disruptive wargaming. And if anybody wants to know more about that, I can share that, OK? Um, another strategy that we think is, is really, really important, and we're seeing more and more and more of this, um, is the partnering thing. The partnering thing, and you can do this sort of in your imagination. So you can say, my company has now just done a joint venture with fill in the blank, Amazon, Google, or Walmart, or whomever it is. Will you get new ideas? We were working with a large bank. Actually, I can mention it was BNY Mellon. They said, help us reinvent banking. Who is this, right? Why are you calling me? How did we get them thinking differently about banking? We used to call it the company takeover exercise. We don't call it that anymore because people are afraid because they think they're going to get fired. It's, it's the joint venture exercise. So if McDonald's and Bank of America or, or BNY Mellon um, did a joint venture, what would they do differently? Right? You know, fast cat, fast food cat, whatever it is, right? Or Nordstrom or whomever, Amazon, Google, or Walmart. If you mash together other companies with your company, I guarantee you will get new business model and new growth strategies. Okay? Um, and those partnerings could be, and, and so they could lead to a partnership. 
Um, uh, I will just tell you, um, and these could be internal partnerships if you're like at a really large organization. You can um, do joint sessions between different divisions. We did one for Fiserv, which is a financial services company. We had their 10 divisions in one room coming up with ways to share leads and do joint uh, selling. And they valued the, the ideas that came out of that day at 125 million, right? We checked back, um, it was almost a year later, and they had realized 72 million of that, right? Did we undercharge? Dramatically, yes, of course, right? But the point here is what? You often, you sometimes look outside for ventures, but sometimes those ventures can be internal, okay? Um, and let's see if there's anything else I want to tell you. Um, I will just tell you in our world, which has been really fun, we have partnered with a lot of different firms now because it makes it so much fun. And I would just encourage you guys to sort of think about who you might partner with. Uh, we were with the, I can mention this, we were with the U.S. Copyright Office uh, a few weeks ago. The guy that we partnered with was a specialist in team development and OD work. And so he had done assessments of all their leaders, and then we went in and did a joint ideation session um, about how this team could work together to generate ideas. Okay? So the partnering thing is, is to me, really, really fun. At the very least, it will create new ideas for you guys and new opportunities about where you could go. All right. Um, the last tech, I, I realized that in the write-up, I told you I would share uh, the billboard technique. Um, that's a technique that we invented, um, and I want to show it to you because, and I was going to have you do the exercise. We don't have time, um, but I'll show it to you uh, because I think it's really important. And by the way, if you're interested, I wrote an article for this on, at Fast Company, and I'll, I'm happy to share that article with you if, if, if I go through this too quickly. But well, let's say you do an ideation session, um, and you've got 200 ideas. How many of those are any good again? Yeah, about 10%. 15 to 20? OK. So now you've got these ideas. What do you do with them? Right? How do you kind of develop that idea to know if it's any good? Right? Or how do you test that idea? We experiment with a lot of different techniques. Um, and the most simple one and most effective one is what we do is we have the teams create a billboard for that idea. So you could think of this as, quote, an elevator speech for the idea. OK, so what's a billboard? What is that? Yeah, if it's an outdoor advertisement. How many words are in the headline, typically? Yeah, it's less than 10. 7 to 10, maybe, right? What else? So you still got a headline. What else do you have? A visual and anything else? A logo, or sometimes it's a call to action, sometimes it's a reason to believe. Okay? So, if you have a, a new idea, anybody have a new idea for anything? What? Baby socks? Socks that do what? Okay. Foot socks, I love that. So, baby socks that actually stay up. The way you, uh, thank you for that. So, uh, so how would you create a billboard for that idea? The way you do it is you come up with, first you list all the benefits. So what are all the benefits of this new kind of, what's the name of this sock? Well, it's like, a, it's like a shelter. You're the one who's enjoying it. Yeah, it's a visual baby. Yeah, baby never knows. Yeah. But the, the, what? what? No show socks. But this is, I thought it was about staying up. Oh, okay. So they sort of, yeah. they what? They get lost in the yeah. shoe. Okay. Yeah. St these are stay put socks. Yeah. Okay, in a way, right? Yeah. You wouldn't call them that. But what, so what's a name for them? What would you call them? Somebody give me a creative name for these socks. Sticky socks. That's fun. It sounds crazy, right? But that's a fun name. Okay, so we'll call them sticky socks. <laughs> sticky socks. Okay, that's kind of fun. Right, it's kind of childlike and kind of fun. What are the benefits of a sticky, see, sticky socks, see? Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so what are the benefits of a sticky sock? What are, stay put. Another, any other benefits? You don't get blisters. The baby doesn't get blisters because they stay put. Another benefit, potentially. They look good. Another benefit. They keep the, the kid's feet warm, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you list all these benefits, yeah. Then you pick the most important one. What's the most important one? Just pick 
They stay put. Okay. So you put that in a headline. What's a headline then? Just, and it doesn't have to rhyme or anything. It's not about being cute. It's about being clear. Stocks that stay put. So give me a headline that's sort of, you know, now, now, <laughs> stocks, stocks, socks, socks that stay put. Okay? All right? What's a visual? You got, what's that? A foot with socks and a big smiling baby and mommy, maybe, right? Maybe, okay. So we got that. That's the visual. What's our reason to believe this? Why are we going to believe they're going to stay put? It's sometimes science or technology. So you say, stay put um, micro technology elastics that are soft and comfortable for the kid, right? And that's the reason to believe, OK? Is that a simple technique? Yes, it is. Is it powerful? Yes, it is. Because you often find that it's an idea that you thought was great, when you go through the discipline of this, there's no big benefit. You say, it was kind of cool and sexy, but, it, but, but it, there's no big benefit. Um, and this then makes it a testable proposition. You can go test it with people and see what they think. OK? So it's 5 of 3. We have five minutes left. That's all I wanted to cover today. Oh, I forgot the never fail trick. Damn. This was in the write-up. The never fail trick was get a, white, get a challenge, put it on a whiteboard, do it for seven days, right? So how do we cut costs? How do we incentivize our employees? How do we improve customer service? You get a whiteboard, you put it on the wall, you invite people to, to this is our invention of a better way to do, and you could do this uh, virtually too, right, electronically, but it's more fun to do it physically in our opinion. You put that challenge, you put it for seven days, each day you start checking it off. What happens on the sixth day? You got all this stuff on there, right? There's all this stuff. And you'll find that you get some eureka moments because you'll start in your mind making connections between these seemingly unconnected things. Yes? What happens after seven days? So now you got all this stuff. You got all these ideas. What happens after seven days? Something. Because you've invited your coworkers, <laughs> I'm not kidding, because you got invited your coworker to come up with these ideas. Then you go do something. You could use it for an ideation session. You could pick the best ones and tell them why you're doing that one. We had a client at Armored Auto. They wanted to design a new package of all things. They put it in the lunchroom, invited people. They had two viable ideas, one of which they're actually doing, just by putting it in the, in the, in the, in the lunchroom. So this is a very simple way. It's a better way. Suggestion boxes never work. Forget suggestion boxes, for the most part. Unless you're Toyota, Frito, Dart Industries, whatever, they almost never work. So just do this whiteboard technique with your team. Okay? I will send you the how-tos on that. All right. Okay, any questions? I hit a lot, right? I hit those five tech, six techniques. What? Oh, the books. Oh, yeah, so this one, this, the, they are, this is on Kindle. Yeah, they're both on, they're both on Kindle. This is also audio. There's a famous audio guy. He's British. He reads it with such import. Oh, my God, it's embarrassing. <laughs> it really is. I'm like, I can't believe the way he's making it seem really important. Um, so th you're, t you're taking a picture? Okay. Yeah. So that one is for the teams, and this one is for aspiring entrepreneurs. This is 21 Days to a Big Idea. A professor at Columbia Business School had, had challenged me, he challenged me to come up with a process for his students to generate better ideas for their ventures, because why? Only one in 12 were any good, he said. <laughs> he said, if I see another cuisine app, I'm going to shoot myself, because why? There are 800 cuisine apps, only two of which are making money, and yet he sees it every term. Three or four or five cuisine apps. So he asked me to create a program, which is what this is. It's a program to get a big idea every day for 21 days, and we've tested it now with a bunch of colleges and universities, and it works. So this is more personal. This is for the teams. Okay? Thank you for mentioning that. Any questions? We've got a minute or two. Yes. I, if you guys leave your e cards or emails, or we have the list, however you want to do it, whatever easiest for you, if I can get the list from Kintone, whatever they give me, if you want to leave your cards, whatever it is, I will send you the how-to techniques on these. I am on LinkedIn. You can. You can do, what, you can do whatever you like. I will, I will send this stuff back. Yes, I'm on LinkedIn, Brian Matamore on LinkedIn, and growth-engine.com is the, the website. So let me see, three, six, nine... 12, 
So if 100 people write me, I'll know that <laughs> this, is, this is more than I thought. But, but for you guys, I'm absolutely happy to send you these, these how-to sheets on everything I talked about today. Absolutely. Oh, to, oh so you're going to thank you for that. I appreciate it. Any other questions? We got a minute left. Any, anybody else? It was fabulous. Thank you. No, there. No, you know, one of the um, there is a there is an innovation firm. Uh, no, it's very smart. We are start talking to private equity guys now about the possibility of working with with some of these ventures and and participating from a percentage standpoint. That's a very good idea. Thank you. Um, and we are uh, looking at that. It's really t you, I don't know how you would do it with a established packaged goods firm, but certainly with uh, some of the newer ventures. Thank you for that idea. It's a good one. Any other questions, guys? Okay, guys, thank you for being here. It was great fun being with you, and um, I wish you well with all your ideas. All right, guys. Yep.